Im Rahmen unseres Sommers der europäischen Spielentwickler hat es uns heute nach Nottingham, nach England verschlagen, denn hier sitzt Crytek UK. Und Crytek UK, das ist ja ehemals Free Radical Design gewesen. Wir blicken heute ein wenig hinter die Kulissen und gucken, wer hier so arbeitet und was hier eigentlich so gemacht wird. Liebe Zuschauer, ich habe jetzt Carl Hilton bei mir. Das ist hier sozusagen der Boss von Crytek UK. Carl, you're the guy behind Crytek UK here, but you guys haven't always been Crytek UK. How did everything start with you guys here in Nottingham? We have a long history as a games company in Nottingham. Um, I originally and quite a few of the guys here originally started off at Rare, which is a you know was a very big company, particularly in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, we set up a company called Free Radical uh, in 1999 here. Nottingham's got quite a long history of making video games. There's quite a few companies have been in this area for a long time, um, and Free Radical ran for almost 10 years, and then Crytek came in, and uh, now we're Crytek. So how come you guys back in the day decided to split from Rare? Um, we were a small team. Uh, you didn't have very big teams in those days. We'd made GoldenEye on the N64, which had been pretty successful for us. Uh, we'd pretty much finished making Perfect Dark, which was also we were very happy with. So we felt it was time to go out and, and do something on our own. Um, it was very c capable of doing that in those days because you could have very small teams. So we thought it'd be fun to go off and, and do it for ourselves. So we did and we formed Free Radical. Was there ever a time that, uh, you know, when you, when you started Free Radical that you thought, oh my God, we're not going to make it, doing this on our own is, 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 is different? No, I think we were far too naive for that. We were, <laughs> we were, we were all gung-ho and, and yeah, we're going to go and make the greatest game ever. We, we just made GoldenEye, we were on a roll, so we were very positive and enthusiastic and have lots of problems as you go along, but nothing that we ever thought was going to stop us. So it was it was great time, actually, very enthusiastic. Well, we always believed that we could make quality games. We knew we had good coders and good art and we had good design, so we were never worried about the quality of what we were doing. Whether you're going to hit a resonance with the public and the game players, you don't know. Um, we, th we always believed in multiplayer gaming. We thought we saw that was a strong part of GoldenEye, and we wanted to, to look at that more. So for us, doing a multiplayer thing like Time Splitters with a bit of freedom and a bit of humor and, and something a bit different from s some of the more serious games, we felt that was a great idea, and that's why we made it. You're the kind of ultimate kind of stakeholder in terms of what the game is, uh, what it's about, and um, communicating that to all the stakeholders and to the team. So we push really hard in terms of kind of communicating this, uh, uh, the idea of the game and what it's going to be about, uh, coordinating from design um, with code, with um, all the departments, animation, everything, from everything from this kind of story, narrative side of stuff to the, you know, the core mechanics what the game's about, um, the uh, pretty much everything, you know, every aspect of that. But then also working with the publishers and, you know, with the team and making sure all of those kind of goals and ideals are kind of matched. I enjoy what I do and uh, and I think it's great that, you know, you're able to kind of, you know, have this vision for the game and push it through. So, yes, there's a lot of work and a lot of pressure involved with that, but uh, at the same time, that's not something I particularly dwell on. It's more the fact that you're getting to create a, you know, create a triple-A game, which is exactly what I want to do. How do you go about recording something like that? Do you get an actual gun in here and start firing it? <laughs> Is it something you can you can create with your with your machines? Uh, how does that work? Um, it's it's a mixture of both. We we were very lucky and. Um, Uh, last year, Crytek sent a couple of guys to the desert in America uh, with a load of guns, which so sounds a, a dangerous thing to me. I, w I wouldn't trust myself with a gun. But they, they spent a few weeks shooting every manner of rifle, sniper gun, you know, uh, heavy machine gun, all that kind of stuff. Came back and then we took those, those uh, sounds and then manipulated them to make them sound even bigger. Okay. Because uh, 
shooting a, a machine gun in real life isn't as it, it's exciting to do but it doesn't sound as exciting as you'd want in a game so okay. so we we uh bling them up a little bit yeah, we wanted the sound of like a head crack sound okay um which obviously we're not going to get someone in the studio and <laughs> crack their head <laughs> so we had an old v, uh, vcr player you know video recorder yeah. which um was was no longer working and we got a, a huge hammer and we were just like <laughs> like that and although to, you know it doesn't you you'd think well, how would that sound like a head crack but finally you know mix it in with a few other sounds and it sounds pretty pretty tasty <laughs> uh, warren you're one of the animators here at crytech uk um we see something on the screen moving there this is something that you're responsible for and this is something that we do not see in nature because of course it's a robot how long does it take for you to animate something like this and make it look as good as it does well um yeah i think it takes it depends on what the uh the animation is but for instance for a walk um mm -hmm. you go through a number of iterations of it you have you know you make a a prototype and then you give get feedback from your your boss i guess your I mean lead in this case um and then we we knock out a number of versions of it until we're finally happy with the way it goes so there is no time limit unfortunately it can okay. take days it can take a week it can take if it needs to more We had a great idea for a game, we thought, um, and, and that game ended up being Haze. But the game that was actually finally released was not... It went through a very long and protracted development period. It had a lot of changes in specification, changes in the platform we were aiming at. Um, it was a shared IP with Ubisoft publishers, so there were some slight differences of ideas there. And so the game that we actually ended up launching was not the game we initially set out to make. And how come then uh, Crytek swooped in? How did that all happen? Um, well, this was sort of... 2008 um, and we had some big contracts in place with, with several publishers um, there's been a lot of stuff on the internet about what happened uh, needless to say several publish the, the credit crunch came along money got withdrawn from projects and and we found ourselves being a company that was a bit too large uh, with with spending a bit too much money and from from my our point of view as, as owners of the business we wanted to ensure the long-term success of the su uh, success of the company so um, we ended up having to to look for people to to try and take over the business for us and we do, in the uk we do that through a process of administration where we look for new buyers um crytek uh, were very interested they came along and spoke to us and uh, we managed to they managed to come in and take the company in and keep it going the, a good core of the of the people who work here were people who worked at Free Radical for a long time. So there's a, there's a core group of people who have known each other for a long time. Um, but having said that, we've had a lot of new talent in since. Um, you always need fresh people coming in with fresh ideas. So hopefully there's a nice blend there between experience and new fresh people. When, when Crytek first came in, they, they always said to us that they wanted us to be a very independent studio with our own distinct culture and our own distinct way of doing stuff. We share a lot of work with, with Frankfurt, particularly we do quite some, make some quite good contributions to the CryEngine technology in the studio. Mm -hmm. Um, so we work closely with Crytek on a lot of technology issues, um, but in terms of creativity, certainly for Homefront 2, that's a, pro a, a project that's been entirely driven from the UK studio. Um, and in terms of the multiplayer element of Crisis uh, games, we, we come up with all the design elements for that, and obviously we talk to to uh, Frankfurt for the single player game to find out what they're doing and how we can how we can share resources and work together on stuff. But all of in terms of design and technology and stuff, a lot of that is done here. So we, we are very independent from that point of view. I'm currently working on some environments, um, mostly architecture. Um, okay. I'm an artist, I generally work on the environments, um, focus on getting the level from start to finish. Uh, okay. So what does your daily routine as an artist here at Crytek UK look like? I mean, do you, do you work together with a lot of the 2D artists or is it, is it stuff that you come up with on your own? Where do you get your sources from to, to know what you have to do? Yeah, I mean, we, as soon as I come in, generally, start on the day-to-day -day task but in terms of the art production as a whole generally mm -hmm. the level is dictated by the directors and kind of the um, a collaboration of ideas okay. um, under the overarching direction of the art director um, and then you will 
go through the processes and the steps of white box and okay. our production and stuff like that. Um, okay. And yeah. <laughs> so, so what is this program that you're working with? Is this something that that users out there could buy for a lot of money, or is it something? Is this a tool that that was specifically created by you guys for for the games? Yeah, I mean, we use 3ds Max, uh, Photoshop, um, the typical industry standard uh, applications. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of our internal programs, we've obviously got CryEngine 3 and Sandbox, um, okay. and we use that to introduce everything to the engine um, okay. and add all the objects into the world and stuff like that. <laughs> Pretty much everyone I've talked to and I've asked them what's their background, how'd they end up here, uh, pretty much everyone has said they're, they're self-taught, they just, you know, made it their hobby and then their hobby became their profession. Is it the same with you or did you did you, did you you study to be an artist? Um, pretty much. I mean, uh, again, when I when I was starting many decades ago, um, the art education that was available wasn't really um, the sort of thing I wanted to do. I was always interested in video games and uh, that side, side of things, so um, after a few Trying a few different things, I ended up trying to get into the games industry. Uh, I just did a portfolio of drawings in my spare time. And about 16 years ago, a company gave me a chance and uh, I've been doing various game related jobs ever since. So yeah, pretty much self-taught and always trying to uh, you know, learn new techniques and okay. different approaches. We're seeing right here, this is a car that you drew. How long does it take you to do something like that? And well, uh, I as a quick example, this is just the sort of thing I do to keep myself um, practiced. I mean, this isn't for, for work. Okay. But um, in between jobs or at lunch times or after work, I like to do quick study. So I just fi find like an interesting picture on the internet. So you're working with this piece of uh, hardware here, with this yes. the stick and everything. Uh, is traditional drawing then on a piece of paper is that obsolete nowadays in, in the video no, game industry? Not at all. Uh, as you can see here, I mean, it always boils down to good drawing, and that's something I practice in sketchbooks and okay. uh, go to life drawing classes. Uh, again, I don't have formal traditional art training, but uh, I believe it's a really important part of this this job I don't think you can do it as well with, okay. without it so yeah definitely traditional pencils and paper all you need um, well previously we did the multiplayer element for crisis 2 um, we're doing the multiplayer element again for crisis 3 we obviously the studio here has a long history of console gaming and multiplayer console gaming so there's a lot of embedded knowledge there which we bring to Crytek hopefully um, and then on top of that we're also working on the next the second version of Homefront Homefront okay. 2 how has, since you have been in the business, how has the business changed? I mean, is it really all about the money nowadays? Is it, is it different from, from what it used to be when you started? Uh, it's changed an awful lot. Um, it's, it's always been a blend of creativity and, and money and finance and getting the whole thing right. Um, it used to be, certainly when we set up Free Radical, that a very small group of people with not a lot of money could go off and, and just make a game. And, and if you sold enough units and they didn't have to be huge numbers, you could, you could make money out of it. These days, the, the investment required because of the technology and the scale of the games means that that's not such a viable thing to do, certainly for console gaming. But in other spaces like tablet and mobile, that kind of thing is coming up again. So it, it, it's, that's what makes this industry so fun because it changes so much. And what you knew five years ago is, is not necessarily relevant to what you need to know now. So you, you have to be on the ball. Um, I think it's a fascinating time to get involved in the games industry still because there's so many new platforms coming along and, and for us as a company there's new methods of distribution so it's not just about making a game yeah. and sticking it in a box and putting it in a shop now it's about digital distribution it's about free to play uh, it's about you know, all the spin-offs into tablets and, and, and mobile and that kind of thing so yeah it's completely different to when I started but it's, it's, it gets more and more interesting every day in that sense. Das war unser kleiner Rundgang hier durch Crytek UK in Nottingham. Sehr interessant, vor allen Dingen deshalb eben, weil das Ganze sozusagen aus den Anfängen bzw. von Rare her stammt. Dann wurde das Ganze Free Radical Design und dann eben Crytek UK. Ich bin gespannt, was die Jungs noch rauskloppen. Sie haben ja schon gesagt, an, äh, sie arbeiten gerade an dem Multiplayer-Modus von Crisis 3 und sie arbeiten an Homefront 2. Natürlich, klar, zu diesen Sachen kann noch nicht viel gesagt werden. Das war aber auch nicht der Fokus unserer Tour, sondern wir wollten euch einfach mal dieses 
Studio eben etwas näher bringen, wie die Leute hier arbeiten, wie das Ganze hier funktioniert. Ich muss wirklich sagen, ich habe ja schon viele Studios auch gesehen, aber es sind sehr sympathisch hier die Gruppe, die Leute, mit denen wir gesprochen haben, sehr, sehr offen. Und ja, ich hoffe, das wird sich dann auch qualitativ in den zukünftigen Projekten widerspiegeln. Ich würde es den Menschen hier, die hier arbeiten, auf jeden Fall gönnen.